Good evening and welcome to this Royal Mar Whiskies Tasting with Berry Brothers and Rudd. Undoubtedly one of the most remarkable booze companies in the United Kingdom with centuries of experience of shipping fine wine and spirits from around the world and independent bottling of whiskey, one of the very earliest to do this, uh, as we'll hear from Johnny later on. But not only that, they have this incredible retail establishment in London, one of the most atmospheric, historic and beautiful shops uh, I've ever been in. If you like wobbly old floors and wonky doorways and, and walls that could speak of centuries of remarkable people uh, going, going through those doors, then you should visit St James and Berry Brothers and Rudd and if you could get a tour from Ronnie Cox, I would heartily recommend it. So before we introduce our guests, uh, a little bit of um, housekeeping. So I suppose, first of all, the, the dramming order, um, as we like to just let you know, so you can lay out all your bottles. Um, we'll begin with the Glen Murray, then the mystery cask. Uh, I'll explain more about that later on. Uh, the Ben Nevis, 1996. The Ardmore, and finishing up with the Williamson. So, Glen Murray, Mystery Cask, Ben Nevis, Ardmore, and finishing with the Williamson. We'll also have time, I would think, for questions at the end uh, and your comments. In fact, I see plenty coming in already. That's great. Thank you. They're really encouraging. It's great to know that people are watching and uh, they're not watching the football. Um, so no comments about the score in the football. I'm watching the highlights. Come on, Scotland. Um, uh, but please put your comments in. We might bring some up on the screen. And then I'm sure there'll be time for a few questions for Ronnie or Johnny um, or myself. But I, it's, uh, the guests, I'm sure, who you'd like to ask questions to. So we'll bring those up you know, more towards the end. But feel free to, to put them there. So our guests, the two honours. Um, uh, one is uh, what I would like to think of as a as a neo luddite who abhors the changes of the last few decades and wishes all progress in technology and production and marketing and sales of whiskey could just be put back like it was in the fifties. But we'll hear from Johnny McMillan later on. Ronnie Cox is one of the most. Uh, gracious and uh, noble servants of our glorious whiskey trade. There are a lot of great characters, uh, but he was selling whiskey when it required selling. Nowadays, it just seems to walk off the shelves itself as it is this golden child of the spirits industry. But he saw that when it was required a little bit of selling in a few unfashionable places, um, but he always did it with uh, this grace and this charm and this warm look in his eyes and, uh, and a handshake that, that um, bred trust and helped people fall in love with whiskey for a long time. So that, that's one of the reasons he's so respected and, uh, and admired and loved in, the, in this trade. So it's a great pleasure to count the two of them as friends and to have them with us tonight. Um, let's bring in Mr. Ronnie. Um, where are you? Ronnie, how nice to see you. Arthur, how wonderful to be here. What a joy. Yes, isn't it? It's nice to get together and have a few drums. Well, in these days, I'm afraid, you know, things, things are pretty bad. But as you rightly say in your introduction, where you big me up far too big, by the way, um, <laughs> the, the way in which whiskey is to be sold in the future is going to be completely transformed from what it was uh, in yesteryear. There's no doubt about it. When I first started 40 years, years ago, um, traveling the world, I was called a leg man. And uh, <laughs> I tried what was um, then um, called, it was actually called Distillers Company Limited before it became United Distillers and then, of course, Diageo. But even before that, my career started in a, in a vineyard in, in Wiesbaden. Henkel Trocken was the name of the company. A wonderful, secular high, sparkling wine. And I spent, um, I think it was nine wonderful months there learning German. Uh, and following that, I went to Spain 
and Gonzalez Baez, the sherry people down in the south of Spain, where they introduced me not only to the world of sherry, but also, of course, to the world of, of whiskey. So having done that, learned a little bit of Spanish and then came back again, it was my next opportunity, I suppose, is to try and get a job somewhere. And I remember being invited to a, a lunch in probably the grandest house of, uh, that I'd ever been in, it's certainly in London. And, and as a jock, as a, set, as a Scotsman myself, <clears throat> I rarely seen such grandeur and, and opulence as was demonstrated to me over lunch at the Distillers Company Limited, which is 20 and 21 St. James's Square, one of the most prestigious addresses in London. And of course, a lot of the Scotch whiskey companies had their headquarters in London at that time, and certainly the Distillers Company, which in those days owned, you know, five or six of the greatest whiskey companies, um, just demonstrated how powerful and, and, and wealthy they were. Um, and of course, people weren't traveling as much in those days, so London was a natural hub, really. To go up to Scotland and the distilleries was kind of a rarity. Today, of course, everybody loves doing it, and quite rightly so, because it is some of the most beautiful country in the entire wide world. So I would thoroughly encourage tourism. But when I started, uh, they put me on a six-week course around, I think it probably was a total of 20 different distilleries. Um, and I had enormous fun, ending up in Steps, which is just outside Glasgow, um, and joined a company called Buchanan, James Buchanan, the company limited, of the owners of black and white whiskey and Buchanan whiskey. And I worked in the bottling hall. Um, I was just discussing this with Dave Broom the other day. Dave, Dave started a few years after me, but he was started in the same bottling hall. Amazing. Um, it, was, it was an extraordinary coincidence. Of course, over the years, when you get to know people who were, you know, people like himself and, and various others who really sort of pioneered the work of, of the single malt evolution um, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, you spend a lot of time in their company because they're just magical people and they have contributed so enormously, uh, like your good self and like Johnny will do and is doing. Hardly, um, hardly. <laughs> let's just let, let people know at home because Ron is often flying already. Um, let's just let them know. We're on the Glen Murray. We will please pour yourself a dram, add water as you see fit. It has, uh, what are we talking, strength-wise? Yeah, nearly 60%, so it'll probably take a little bit of water. We'll chat. I think we're going to give people a tour of St. James, aren't we, of, of the Berry Brothers' premises. And then we'll have a little recap at the end um, of the dram before we move on to the next one. Ronnie, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Do, 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 do you want... Thank you for doing so, because uh, I have a habit <laughs> of, of just uh, dribbling on. Um, well, it's, it's, what are your finer habits, Robert, Ronnie? <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all in the nature of the beast, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, let's go to St. James's, hmm. uh, the home of Barry Brothers and Rudd. So, uh, everyone bear with me at home because there's a bit of technical stuff. The screen may look a bit funny for a while, but Berry Brothers have this amazing widget, um, which is perfect for recreating an experience I had actually with the competition winner, wasn't it? The first time we ran the mystery cask and we had a day with the winner of the staff comp, Johnny, yourself, and uh, the winner of, um, uh, of the competition of the first one who correctly guessed Kalila. And we had this amazing afternoon and evening of you touring us around, uh, giving us a tour around this oh, incredible premises. Well, well, we we I drank a lot. Again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, it, it, the idea was for the competition to be the same thing again, but obviously that doesn't look feasible. So they just win lots of whiskey and they can get as drunk as we did. So <laughs> let me let me add in. So, you know, whilst so, you're trying to get it up, um, the Berry Brothers and Rudd was started way back um, in 1698, and it started off as a coffee shop. In the 1650s, uh, St. James's really was considered to be the centre of London, I suppose, but for the well-to-do. And it all started because of the um, development of St. James's Palace for Henry VIII by, for his second wife, Anne Boleyn. So that's back in 1536. But Berry Brothers started uh, uh, in 1698 as a coffee shop. That was its original function. And it developed then into a spice selling company um, and these were all trappings of the, the great and the good. 
who uh, would <coughs> parade up and down St. James's Street, and, and they would be probably friends of the king. Uh, they would go into these coffee houses. There were over 100 in the area of St. James's, um, and somebody needed to provide coffee. So Berry Brothers and Rudd was the one of the main suppliers of coffee to the coffee houses there. I b- believe that's the coffee mill up in front there, is it? There is the coffee mill there. For 300 odd years, we had the sign of the coffee grinder uh, outside until some uh, student rather over the top, inebriated, I think he was, but clever climber. He managed to remove it and is probably sitting in some bed sit now um, in, <laughs> in a university somewhere. Um, but there's the coffee grinder. And <clears throat> over on this side here, we've got the scales or the balance. Uh, those were the original scales for weighing sacks of coffee for the coffee houses. Um, and then in 1765, when it was discovered that health, were, or keeping good health, were naturally prolonged your life, they were used for weighing people, and their weights would be then recorded in ledgers that we've still got to this day, but wonderful record of the people who used to be the dandies, I suppose, of the day, who were wandering up and down St. James's Street, um, but the well to do. Uh, and their weights would be recorded on regular occasions. Lord Byron was one of them, um, Beau Brummel, another one. You know, these were, and uh, the king used to come in occasionally too, and various others um, who were, of course, of the society, I suppose, in those days, I'm talking in the 1700s. Um, so this is more or less as it was when um, it opened up. Uh, the floor slopes, it's very wobbly, as you rightly say, and uh, you, we see on occasions what I call the um, St. James's sidestep, which is that corrective step that you might take after a very good lunch combined with a wobbly floor. Um, if we walk straight through here, we go to the oldest room in the entire building. So underneath the clock and into what we call the parlor. Now this was the chairman's office for very many years and is now still used as an office, as and when we can, of course, but it's probably more famous for the fact that in 1923, it was the place that Cutty Sark was created. The brand Cutty Sark, which really held body and soul together of this wine merchant for over 70 years. It was launched during prohibition. We obviously couldn't ship it into the United States of America, but we had a very good agent in the British Bahamas who then knew a few of the people who uh, managed to get it in some way or other into the United States of America and Cutty Sark became extraordinarily popular so that in 1933 when Prohibition ended Cutty Sark was already one of the most established brands there. It was created first of all for the fine wine lovers of Berry Brothers and Rudd, the customers of Berry Brothers and Rudd because they were insistent on having a whiskey that didn't have too much smoke in it because if you drank whiskey and soda before dinner as was the norm amongst those um, those sort of people, the smoke, as we all know, would be retained on the palate so that when you were tasting fine wines at dinner, then you would the, the wines wouldn't be quite as good as they would have been otherwise. So um, they demanded something which was without smoke. And so Barry Brothers and Rudd introduced Cutty Sark, which was a, a wonderful um, saviour, really, to a business which then... Um, not only survived, but developed into um, what is now a a large business or a medium large business with offices in the United States of America, uh, in Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan. And we have um, no longer got the brand of Cutty Sark. Uh, We sold that in 2010. But in exchange, we then bought um, the brand of of Glenrothes. And Glenrothes is the brand that I really uh, trying to uh, be in the sort of sandwich board of Glenrothes for the last uh, 30 years. <laughs> really, basically from nothing into, into what it is um, today. We sold the brand actually in 2017 back to the people we had bought it from, the Edgerton Group, um, the owners of uh, obviously uh, various distilleries in those days. There were seven distilleries, but um, the reason we took Glenrothes or developed it was A, because of an association that our deputy chairman had then with... Um, the Highland Distilleries, um, but it was mainly because uh, Glen Rothis whiskey, uh, the malt whiskey, was the backbone of Cutty Sark. That and Punahabin were really the two key components in the malt side of, of Cutty Sark. And so it was a kind of natural development that we 
took on the brand Glenrothes. So in this in this room here, you see the evolution of the bottle from I think about 1620 to about 1795. And on the extreme right there, the bottom shelf, you'll see sort of, you know, today's port bottle is not too dissimilar to that. Um, there's a wonderful picture in here, which is uh, from Pussyfoot Johnson, who was a great advocate of, of prohibition. Um, and he came over to the UK to try and do, introduce prohibition into the United Kingdom, persuade the then prime minister to do the same. And he met Mr. Berry on the same ship, sailing from, I think it was from New York to Southampton. And they'd obviously had an altercation over dinner because he wrote a letter, which is now in a frame to the writer of the fireplaces we look at it, saying, uh, Dear Mr. Berry, permit me to recommend that your son be trained for the cloth, i.e. a minister of the church, rather than for the wine trade, which I assure you is a vanishing industry. And have a look at the, um, the, uh, the, cellar, the Napoleon uh, cellar, yeah. where... We've got. I've just, I've, I've just before we scoot straight on down, just because there are, it is so there are so many beautiful rooms. I'm just going to show a few as we go down. Yeah. So uh, dining ah. rooms. Well, um, you remember that one? Yeah, absolutely. We had a lovely dinner. I remember having some a glass of champagne in here. Um, champagne in there, in the, in the drawing room, then in yeah. the spirit room. Uh, yeah, that's. Got a lovely picture there of uh, four or five gangsters on the wall there who were, of course, you know, the likes of Legs Diamond, uh, Lucky Luciano, Al Capone, um, but sitting on the right hand side to the left hand side of that door, you can see the white door. Um, and I'd recommend anybody who happens to, to come to Berry Brothers and Riley, come and, come and have a tour before you buy anything, you know, because it is, it's full of history, as you rightly say, at the beginning. So, this is a sample room, a tasting room that we have. Um, it's quite a modern one, actually. This used to be offices, but we've changed it into a, uh, just a wonderful tasting room. Typically, of course, the Berry Brothers and Brothers, the previous tasting room was about, you could fit about five people into it. And uh, that one, of course, we can get 20 or 30 in it quite happily. And then this is the newest addition, the cellars, the underground cellars here that we've uh, had recently designed in the last five years um, to look like a Catalonian bodega, uh, a cave or a, a cellar in uh, Catalonia. Um, and that is a, just the most wonderful place for uh, reception. And then downstairs, through that oval um, shape in the middle, uh, you've got a dining area as well for, I think it's about 40 people. So moving on to this one, this is the Napoleon cellar. And here we can fit about 70 people um, along three tables, so this is one of them, this is the main table. Um, and one of the great advantages of, of coming to dine here is A, is it's a, it's a completely, you know, it, it's experiential in the sense that it's, it's, it's completely different to any other um, restaurant. We have a three-star Michelin chef who uh, leads a team of chefs, obviously. Um, and the wines are at very advantageous prices compared to uh, London restaurant prices, of course. And you can have the choice of, you know, any of the wines that we've got in Berry Brothers and Rudd. So for a little more than really corkage um, to, to each bottle. It's a fun place. It's very popular. Um, I can't remember exactly how many thousand people we used to have to come in um, every, every year. But these are used. We have five dining rooms varying from, I think it's four to um, 75 about. Um, each one slightly different. Uh, but we basically cater for all occasions. Wonderful. Thank you, Ronnie. That was a, a super tour. Um, and uh, it, is a, it is a remarkable place. And it's a great little widget that, that does show that from these rather elegant shop front, how it just opens up below into all these, in, in, into these beautiful camps. So I've been enjoying this Glen Murray very much. Um, we uh, just quickly, because how are you over 20 minutes in, so should we, we should keep moving forward. But um, uh, one of those distilleries that uh, um, can sometimes get a bit overlooked, but I think it just takes the bourbon casks so well. Um, and this has a nice balance of spirit and uh, spirit character. And then that lovely coconutty, vanillary, custody kind of bourbon barrel kind of style. But elegant Glen Murray fruit and grass. It's a really, really good example of it. It's a great yeah, start, yeah. isn't it? And I, I think it's very much a sort of, it's, it's a light style, obviously. It's a, what I call an uplifting style. 
I, I, I tend to put into various categories of sort of uplifting conversation and relaxation. All that was, you know, 40 years ago, I had to try and understand whiskeys a little bit more than I did before selling black and white, where it was all about the uh, amount of advertising you did uh, rather than the public relations and talk about the intrinsic qualities of the brand. Mm. So uh, I'd love to hear more about your career very soon. Um, and but I should probably let people move on to dram number two and explain a little bit about this competition and how it works. So this is the second time we've done it. Um, we have bottled a single malt Scotch whiskey into these little miniatures. These are the only little miniatures of this bottling that will exist, especially done for these packs. By buying this pack, you um, are automatically entered into this competition. And if you correctly guess, or if you win, you get a bottle of everything tasted tonight, a 70 CL bottle of all five whiskies, which is a great prize. And the way it works, you have to email us the distillery, the age, the cast type, and a short tasting note. Um, you don't have to write an essay, a bit of fun in there. Ronnie's, if it does come to that tiebreaker, as you can see, Ronnie is a man with a sense of fun. Make him laugh and you stand a better chance. Um, but crucially, the, dist <laughs> the distillery first. If um, How does it work? So if more than one person guesses the distillery, then it goes to distillery and age. If more than one person gets distillery and age, it's distillery, age, and cast type. If more than one person gets all those three things correct, well played, everyone, if you do, then you, the tiebreaker is the short tasting note judged by Mr. Ronnie Cox. Um, so the actual whiskey will be revealed uh, on Wednesday. Yeah, so we need your entries by 2 o'clock on the Tuesday to process them. I'm so relieved I managed to get through that without accidentally saying the name of the distillery. Um, it, it, it's so hard not to. But because we can't really talk about the whiskey anyway, we need to give people a bit of time um, to, to, to assess this whiskey. Um, tell us, Ronnie, tell us you've, you've traveled the world. You've, you've been in this game a while. What, where have you been in the world? Who are the people you've met? What, 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 has, uh, the, what has the experience of selling whiskey? How you know, has that changed over time? My father, my father said to me, what are you going to do? If you don't go to university, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I, there are only three things I really like doing, which is traveling, the joys of travel, um, people, you know, understanding people and the intrigue of alcohol. And he said, you will never find a job that accomplishes all those three things and you can have fun. Don't forget you're working. This is not about fun. You've got to live your life um, with a passion, but you've got to work on the other side, as if there were sort of two lives involved. And I said that there has to be an alternative. So, you know, when I joined Black and White Buchanan's, I was sent on a six week trip around the world. And I found that one of the most fascinating times ever. The, the, the different cultures were just so surprising and eye opening to me. We had a pretty sheltered background, I think, um, up in Scotland and then down here a little bit. And then I went to Latin America. And Latin America in the 19, uh, 70s, let me tell you, was, was consuming whiskey um, without paying much tax or duty on it. In fact, I think it was estimated at the time that 80% of the whiskey that was consumed in Latin America at that time, with military dictatorships in almost every single country, um, it was, um, the, the 80% was consumed without taxes and duties, so it was therefore duty free, effectively. But it wasn't any duty free. A lot of countries were shipping, you know, over the border from one to another, from islands into Venezuela and into Colombia and so on. And I've had probably the most exciting times of my life. I was still a bachelor when I went down there. But I've had some just wonderful time, one of which I will tell you, which was when I was um, pursuing a new distributor in Colombia. And I thought he was just absolutely magical. I thought he had the right attitude and I thought he would have the right dis distribution because he was a wholesaler. Um, but I was warned off him by the Johnny Walker distributor who was rather jealous of him. And I went, he didn't have any money, he said. So I went to see him and I said, look, you know, I'd like to sell you 500 cases of, of black and white whiskey um, and a couple of hundred cases of Buchanan's, but 
I gather you don't have any money, so how are you going to pay us? Oh, he said, and he drew out, he, he opened this top drawer of his desk, um, and he drew out a white package, a, pa a package of white powder inside, and he chucked it at me. <laughs> and I said, I cannot believe this. I've been pursuing you, you've been pursuing me for over six months, and you're now telling me you're going to pay in Coke. He said, it's really good. <laughs> And with that, he stamped it with a pencil, made a hole in it, and then got my finger and put my finger into it. I said, what do I do now? He said, put it on your tongue. It was sugar. It was sugar. From that moment on, he became one of my greatest friends. Uh, we had enormous fun together, and he grew Black and White and Buchanan's into the leading brands of both standard brands and 12-year-old uh, whiskey in, in Colombia. But the, there were hundreds of occasions where I, I have very happy and, and very frightening memories of, you know, being, I was the first airplane in Paraguay after the coup d'etat, where Strosner was overthrown by his son-in-law. And my, the people who were there supposedly to collect me with guns and, and security guards and everything else had disappeared because they were part of the Strosner organization. And I never saw them again. Um, and uh, I went to the Palace of Justice in 1985 in, in Bogota in Colombia, was surrounded by um, by tanks because M19, the terrorist group, was in there um, with, and, and holding the judges hostage. I mean, there, there were lots and lots of those sort of things that went on, some frightening, some magical, and, and mostly magical, actually, mostly wonderful. wonderful. Well, your, your job as well, which I could never do because it's the late night, it's the entertainment and the late nights, and you must have been in every form of discotheque and... <laughs> anywhere with a late license at two in the morning with a customer. You were there in all sorts of countries. Um, and of course, yes, you're so right. And every I knew every nightclub, all the great nightclubs all over the place. I knew um, a lot of the, the slightly underworldly people that used to run those, those types of clubs in certainly in Latin America. Um, I knew a lot of contrabandistas too. And uh, I, I once went out with uh, a bunch of contrabandistas in, in Brazil. Uh, nobody, no whiskey salesman um, had ever met these underworld characters. And I was told to turn up at a certain restaurant at a certain time. And in Brazil, of course, everybody arrives an hour late. So but I was an hour, I was British time. Um, and I had dressed down. So I bought myself a t shirt and some plimsolls, you know, some sneakers and a, and a pair of blue jeans. And there I was in this restaurant, which is actually a very smart restaurant. I felt a bit out of place. And the, I said after an hour, um, is Mr. Shu here? He didn't give me his real name, but if Mr. Shu was the chap I was supposed to meet. Oh, Mr. Shu has been here for an hour. Are you the, you the English person? I said, well, I'm a, I'm a jock, really. I'm a Scotsman, but um, I am that person. He said, oh, he's over there. And there in the corner were a group of eight people all dressed in Armani suits with Gucci shoes and Rolex watches looking absolutely immaculate. They had dressed up thinking of the sort of person they thought that I was. And then I had dressed down thinking that they were slightly different characters, the ones they actually were. It was an extraordinary, um, it was an extraordinary 72 hours. And when I got back to the hotel, because I hadn't been to sleep for 72 hours, the, they had sold my hotel room to somebody else and my belongings were downstairs with the, with the porter. <laughs> they sold your belongings to someone else. No, they'd sell the hotel to somebody else. My belongings oh, were downstairs. Oh, okay, okay, phew. The phew. hotel room they had sold to somebody else. My belongings were downstairs with the porter. Um, but there were countless, I mean, I've lo lost my passport a couple of times. I always should have two passports because I was so um, scatty, and my son is exactly the same poor chap. Um, but I've left countless pairs of shoes and socks. But I have, I have eaten in over 4,000 different restaurants, and I've met... Um, countless wonderful people whose um, whose color and and contribution has has really created a masterpiece for my for me in my in my life it, I just had so much fun and really in the last 30 years it's probably become as I say more about the product than it was about the style or the imagery of the of the brands and as a result um, I, I think people because there's a collective movement towards flavor um, I, I think Everybody has has jumped up and 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 started to improve what um, 
was available before in terms of uh, whiskies and so on. That's not to say they weren't really good in the olden days, and, and I would support that 100%. But I think that we've been, and the Japanese obviously have got very good at it, and they've got a great reputation, um, and you know, various others now are starting around the world. And I think it's just given us a shot in the arm and said, look, uh, you know, look after your product, keep improving it, raise the bar. Um, and, and this wonderful experimentation that's going on with a lot of checks, not only the Scotch Whiskey Association, which I incidentally, I think is a, is a fantastic organization. No other spirits, spirits industry has got that sort of thing. Um, and, and the fact that you've got, you know, bloggers, distillers, amateur distillers, professional distillers, uh, writers, journalists, people who are keeping others in check. So this industry is not going to go by the by. It's going to be, it's underpinned with quality people, quality tour, quality uh, writings. And, you know, that and shoe leather, i.e. Right? people who actually know what the hell they're talking about, like yourselves, you know, both you, you uh, are, are, they, are they, you know, the next generation to take this little flag on that we've, um, we've we've helped live through and helped develop. I mean, it was a collective. It's a collective thing, and I just happened to be lucky enough to be born at the time when um, it was being developed. I just rode that wave, I guess. Yeah, fantastic to hear these stories, and I hope we'll come back to a few more. But it, it is interesting, isn't it? There's, I mean, I, I imagine there was not not enough room for too many whiskies but now there's so much room for so many small brands to thrive and survive not just with the big blends but also the single malts uh, single malts from japan single malts from india it's almost like i think of it like analog radio there was room on the bandwidth for four or five radio stations and that was it and then suddenly digital comes along and there's a million different stations for whatever you're into and you can right. find with yeah, you can find that the, these delightful little brands that could get quite big or, or whatever. It depends what you're into. It's it's a fascinating time. So many whiskies, aren't there? It's so interesting and so exciting and so so many creative people involved. And when you look back, I mean, when I first started the sort of developing single malts, really Michael Jackson was the only one on the block, and mm. everybody get to know Michael Jackson. He was a beer writer, as we know. You know, he was absolutely brilliant. He was the most lovely man. And he, really he, looked, after, he looked after so many of the the then up and coming whiskey writers. So the Dave Brooms and Martins and and together with Charlie and, and so on. I used to see them wandering around in sort of you know groups of four. You know, inevitably Michael sitting in the looking rather forlorn in a hotel lobby in Los Angeles or Chicago or somewhere saying, What's happened, Michael? Oh he said I've I got up a bit late and I think I've missed my flight. What do you mean you think you've missed your flight? Well, <laughs> I, I, think it was, I think I should have been up an hour earlier. You know, he was wonderfully vague about that sort of thing and needed to have a sort of nanny to take him around. Um, that, that was before he, he um, was not quite so well, but he, he was the most lovely man and, and really a, a pioneer in the development, I suppose, of these single malts, uh, uh, together with, you know, people like Pip Hills, who was, who was well before his time, um, writing about parts of single malt that, that nobody really knew. And then, this, you know, the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society came in and again, very few followers, but those people that did follow it were, were people, you know, like yourself and Johnny, who, who really had a passionate interest in, um, in, in whiskies. And, you know, their fathers or my father, you know, would have one bottle of whiskey in his house. And, mm. if, you know, if somebody asked for a whiskey, that's what you got. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, there's no question of have you got a certain style of, of, of whiskey? Because, you know, when I, when I first joined, a bottle of whiskey was three days pay of the lowest paid. So for the, for when I started off, my wage was such that I could only buy a bottle of whiskey every three days. But then, of course, I had to eat. And so, uh, it, 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 we, we difficult it. choices, difficult and, choices, and Ronnie. Well, you either eat or you drink. <laughs> <laughs> we should, um, we should uh, bring in Johnny soon. Um, uh, so, just to recap, mystery com cast competition. I, I've been just keeping a little eye on the comments, Ronnie, and people have been keeping things very, very close to their chest, saying things like, "Oh, it's distinctive, isn't it?" Without saying what it is, or. I think Robert Weber, I think, was trying to throw a curveball, saying it smelled of tequila. I think there's people playing a few canny games there. But I mean, yeah. you're having a wee, you're having a wee sniff there. I know you can not only tell me the distillery, but you can tell me the age, 
what the Stillman was wearing, whether or not he was wearing underpants, the Stillman's name, all this. He, he was Scottish, actually. It is Scottish single model, so he wasn't wearing any underpants. Was his wife English? <laughs> um, so, but we can't really comment. We can't really say anything about this whiskey. Um, so, uh, but I would agree, it's distinctive. We haven't, we haven't chosen a whiskey that we feel could be confused with lots of other whiskies. That would be mean uh, to, to do something like that. Um, uh, and it is, uh, is it, yeah, it's not a shrinking violet, is it? So let's bring in Mr. McMillan. Hi, Johnny. Greetings. Are you well? Yes, I'm very well, thanks. Yeah, doing great. Um, I feel like I've really lowered the tone of this evening um, by, by sort of a five or six points yet. already. You haven't said anything. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, by, just by image detracts from the, the you look great. class yeah. of Ronnie Cox. Yeah, oh, exactly. He is a class act. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so I think it's only fair to uh, let you talk about uh, our, our next whiskey. So, the Ben Nevis 1996, uh, cast 1196, Sherry Butt finish. Um, so, uh, this was a project that we spoke about a couple of years ago. You came to me really excited, saying, I found this cask. It's fantastic. I'm so excited to bottle it under Berry Brothers and would love all my whiskies to have an exclusive of it. So we bottled it, but we decided that it would be interesting to just bottle half the cask, keep the rest in cask, and then after a period of time, bottle the second half of the cask so we can see how that extra couple of years of maturation developed. There was a bit of a cock up, wasn't there, Johnny? <laughs> There, there wasn't a cock up. Um, the, 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 the official marketing story is that we thought it would be, um, well, I, I, okay, let's be honest. The, the cock up was uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I had given direction for this cask to be re racked. I hadn't tried the sample, and I just thought, you know, an old mid 90s Ben Nevis with a couple of years in a sherry butt would be really, really good. Um, but I hadn't tried the sample, like I say. And then one day the sample, sample came onto my desk. And I was, was trying a bunch of samples that day, and this particular sample just absolutely made my afternoon. You know, I mean, it's it is phenomenal, phenomenal whiskey. Um, and uh, Arthur and I used to live about uh, ten minutes walk apart um, in the same village, and um, it's not quite how it happened. But I feel like I basically just sort of burst out the front door. And ran straight round your house like a sort of Dickensian newsboy. Um, Mr. Botley, Mr. Botley, try this. It was just really exciting. <laughs> my amazing whiskey. Um, this is, is this is now fiction, but carry this, on. This, that, that, that bit is fiction, yeah. But that that's kind of how it felt to me. I was just when I find a good whiskey, it is it's a kind of like instant elation, and I just want to tell everyone about it and instantly get it in the bottle and instantly get it sold. Um, and you know, in, in fairness, I feel Raw Mile do an amazing job of getting equally excited about stuff we bottle yourself and all the guys in the, in the shop as well you know really you've got such an amazing kind of um uh i'm trying to think of the right <laughs> the right word here but such such an amazing little kind of group of nerds in that shop i was gonna say like a sort of cabal nerds or something but um, yeah. In the shop, and they, they all get super excited about whiskey. So you know, I love bottles. A, ne a nest of nerds. We've got a we've got a malt nest of nerds. I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, anyway, right. anyway, anyway. <laughs> um, so we bottled half the cask, um, and uh, the other, the rest of the cask lay in our bottling hall, and then uh, for whatever reason, that archaic re rack instruction that I'd put in like a year before that was suddenly found and someone said, um, oh, there's a sherry bar. Oh, there's a bed there. Let's stick that in there, which I had asked them to do a long time ago um, oh, and, and never got done. Um, so I was pretty uh, mortified to find that had happened. Um, I do remember however, that phone call. It was, it was not the excited boy chapping on my door, Mr. Motley, Mr. Motley, and his law, <laughs> Arthur, something bad has happened. <laughs> yeah, all good, all good, you answered the phone. 
Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I guess if 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 you're not understanding, if you're relatively new to whiskey or, or whatever, what we're talking about. So the the concept was we would bottle half and then bottle the second half and then see how the whiskey two years maturation might make a bit of a difference. But by moving it into another slightly active sherry cask, that kind of ruins the experiment because you've got this extra different cask influence coming in. But thankfully, it's still an interesting experiment and it's still delicious. Well, let, let's tell the truth here. So if you could forget what I said in the last two minutes. At uh, Mary Brothers and Rod, we have expertise in um, wood maturation. and We thought it'd be a wonderful experiment to re-rack <laughs> this into a sherry cask. So very purposefully, We've re-racked the second half into a, a first fill Oloroso cut. Um, uh, and, and in fairness, it has really, really worked. Yeah, I mean, you lose that ability to see how the whiskey would have matured. And I think, you know, it's a tricky thing because, first of all, what you've got is um, that kind of sherry jacket on. So, so Oloroso finishes, brought the whiskey on a little bit. And it but was, also, if people didn't try the first one, it was a, a, a relatively neutral cask. It was a relatively tired cask that just allowed this very delicate spirit. Well, it's not a delicate spirit, but it had a delicate touch to the spirit as it slowly matured. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Johnny? Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, I think the, the nice thing about the sort of extra period of maturation as well is because we'd um, oifed out half the cask, you're left with a bit more headspace in there, which, you know, gives you this kind of oxidization, um, which I think in a whiskey like this really sort of concentrates the flavor. Um, and, you know, this is just my favorite style of whiskey. You know, for me, it's kind of like, it's almost like one of those, um, like uh, Japanese bubble drinks. You know, you kind of, you, you take a wee sip and it's, it's really pretty good. And then just at the kind of back palate into the finish, you it's kind of like, explosion of tropical fruit and it's just like a kind of um it's like a sort of water balloon filled with um tropical compost that just kind of like explodes in the back of your palate um and i, I just absolutely adore this style of whiskey um and i think i think the sherry has added to it you know it, it gives this yeah. kind of slightly tobacco-y kind of like strawberry jam kind of slightly mushy fig um fig thing on the nose and it's, it's a it's a great whiskey in my opinion so well, well done for bottling it. Well, well done for your um, dynamic approach to maturation. Um, Thank you. The, <laughs> I was really, really relieved. It was the fear when you said, because we'd found this perfect whiskey, we were going to let and see if, it, see if it got even more perfect. And then there'd been this weird accidental intervention. When you, when you said a sample's coming your way, I was genuinely nervous about tasting it i was like oh god have we screwed this up but well, not we totally your fault but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but it has this whiskey is this whiskey going to be ruined and plus we know because some finish experiments don't work but i'm sure people plow on because people don't know what it was like before but this yeah. one we've got this record of what, how perfect it was before and have have we trashed it but thankfully not it, it is a different whiskey um but it's it's excellent it's really well delicious. i think i think the thing is you know we gave it 18 months and i think um if we're given it maybe maybe three years you'd probably be um probably be maybe over the hill a bit too much sherry but um the sherry is pretty balanced in there you know it's it's it's, it's quite a delicate finish i think um or re-rack whatever word you want to use um so yeah i think you know i think it integrates with the, the spirit character pretty well um so yeah I'm, I'm happy with it i'm very happy with it and yeah this reputation of ben nevis 1996 just sometimes it just see people talk about vintages but it's just it's a period where the people were making great whiskey consistently and that whiskey survived and didn't get bottled or used in something else. And just, and it's, it's parcels of amazing stock, isn't it? And there's been some really good stuff around, not just that we bottled, but thank you, Eric, for noticing we have, this is the third absolute cracker we've done along with the Amber Light one, which I loved also. Um, so yeah. And briefly, Johnny, I'm going to give you a few minutes to go or geek tastic. What, why is this Ben Nevis stuff? I heard, stuff I heard so your good? introduction is a, a, a neo Luddite, which I quite liked. It made me sound a bit like I was a paid member of the Tory party, which would be too coverage. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, you know, 
people often sort of say, you know, where where does this like big unctuous uh, tropical fruit thing come from? And um, you know, you see it. It's quite funny. You, you obviously see it in older whiskies, um, going back to fifties, sixties. You know, sixties Bemore, sixties Lafroig is the kind of um, absolute apothesis of that style of whiskey. But then it pops up elsewhere. Um, you know, it pops mm-hmm. up in late nineties uh, Ben Nevis, absolutely ninety six to ninety eight. Yeah, I, th- I think you find that character. Um, it pops up very oddly in um, like late eighties Irish stuff. You know, you taste those um, like eighty eight uh, Bushmills, cool stuff, yeah, yeah, yeah and the, a coolie stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all, all that all that stuff floating about in the market. Um, you know, boom! It's amazingly fruity. Uh, it pops up in uh, late nineties Bamore as well. And you know, the only thing that I think you can really uh look at those productions and what they're all doing the same and they are all doing the same and you never see this character they're not doing it is it's this kind of brewer's yeast um concept so sometimes pitching distillers yeast alongside as i think they were at ben nevis in the 90s um but this this kind of uh gentler um ale yeasts or you know repitched brewer's yeast so a slightly longer lag time in the initial fermentation a longer fermentation overall a lower abv um wash and the result is this beautiful tropicality kind of jellied unctuous wonderfulness mm, yeah, um, that's great and with with ben nevis as well which i like about it you know i was lucky enough to catch the end of that period where you could try sixes Beaumont and old lefroig and old ben Riek as well you definitely see it there and some yeah absolutely yeah 76 ben Riek. Oof. yeah Oof. yeah um, oh, um but, but the, thing, the thing about ben nevis is there's a kind of grubbiness about it as well that i really like like people talk about kind of tropical fruit bowls and you know g- g- rotting tropical fruit bowls ben nevis is kind of you come home from the club you've been out with ronnie um you've come home <laughs> you come home from the club and you know the fruit market's kind of packing up and like it's all mushed into the into the ground that's better you you, you, you find your pina colada from the night before <laughs> yeah you just scrape it up drunk with your hand and you know one thing i like about ben nevis as well is it's such a kind of unpretentious distillery um oh, you know I mean, there, there are very few distilleries physically which are kind of as ill-groomed as ben nevis um, and their branding is oh, it's um, a minger. It's an absolute minger. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, it's very kind of Springbank esque in that it's you know it's kind of like, hey, we make a... really bloody great whiskey, so we just don't have to worry about this kind of stuff. And I, I love that, you know, as, as a as a as a whiskey aficionado, I just think if if you've got um, great spirit, then <laughs> you know, you, why are you investing in painting the distillery? <laughs> you know, and that's obviously the approach they take. Well, they they don't need to be pretty. Do they? they they just do not need to be pretty. It's a quirk that it's a quirk of history that they're in such amazing, beautiful places up in Speyside and these beautiful coastal locations. That's a that's a quirk of history. Nothing else. Ben Nevis, we well, well yeah. So it's, it's up it's up there at Bunahaven and the kind of you know like calendar of ugliest distilleries, which yeah. which should definitely be a product you stock. I think. <laughs> a calendar of the ugliest distilleries. Yeah, ugliest yeah so, when, when you when you call up the branch to pitch that idea, I, I can see how that's going to go down. Um, love that description, Arthur Motley. Hi, Tesh. Um, nice to see you. Um, uh, great choice of words, Johnny Unctuous. Un- Johnny Unctuous. That's your new uh, nickname. <laughs> that's your Tinder name, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Um, and actually, Tom, um, I like that. The sherry influence is quite subdued as well, fortunately. That was exactly my feelings when I tried this second sample. Thank God it didn't dominate this, this beautiful heart that is underneath. Um, so I'll just quickly sum up this Ben Nevis, and we'll ask, we'll ask Ronnie for a few words as well in a moment. So uh, let's unmute Ronnie. Um, uh, so we've got this Ben Nevis. What do you think, Ronnie? Yeah, I think it's a cracker. I am talking to you. Are you talking Sorry, to did I not say yeah. that? When I, when I was starting off, Ben Nevis was never known as being one of the, 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 the greats. But I think it was kind of secretive distillery. And in 1955, I think it was bought by Joseph Hobbs, who 
happened to be our US, oh, sorry, our Canadian distributor for Cutty Sark. And he made a fortune out of Cutty Sark um, just after Prohibition. And I think possibly during Prohibition as well, although history doesn't relate. But he bought Nevis Distillery, he bought another distillery, and he bought Inverlochy Castle, which is now, of course, a, a five star um, hotel uh, there. But and, and he also bought a whole lot of land there. And if you happen to travel that road from Spean Bridge to Fort William, and you'll see the Ben Nevis Distillery on the left hand side, on the right hand side, you'll see the very unusual white painted um, cattle sheds. And it's called the Great Glen Cattle mm. Ranch. CH. Of course, no self-respecting Scotsman would ever know what a ranch was. So it was always a sort of it was a it was a site of intrigue for most of us. As when I used to go to Fort William, which was every year, I suppose, as a, as a child, and uh, going past the Great Glen Cattle Ranch, and then the Glen, the Ben Nevis Distillery was painted white, but it was no beauty, as you rightly say. And I think that magically it seems to have got. But I I often think it may be something. But Johnny, you you've got more about it than I have about the yeast and. Uh, I find with Glenrothes that you get these sort of super tropical fruits coming through just by serendipity. It wasn't it wasn't anything you could actually um, you could actually predict, but it just kind of happened, and it tended to be with American oak uh, second fill hoggies uh, rather than anything else. But that's that was Glenrothes, and, it, and I remember John Ramsey saying. When I had a discussion with him about it, he's saying, do you know, Ronnie, I've, I've tried for the last 35 years, I think it was, to find out how we, we managed to do that um, or how it how it just serendipitously, uh, serendipitously <laughs> uh, how it <laughs> through fortune, good fortune um, just appeared. And, and there was no there was no real logic because we tried all sorts of things and it, it happened it happened it was all to do with age and and there's the only two common factors age over 20 years and and uh second bill hoggies refill hoggies yeah so very briefly because i'm sure people ask just um so we're putting that whiskey live at about nine o'clock when we finish basically so we, we yeah we will we'll get cracking so at about about nine o'clock we'll put that online we sent an email to anyone who bought a tasting pack with a code so it's a locked product just for tonight basically so um, anyone who bought a pack gets the opportunity to buy it first no pressure mm -hmm. it just gives people the opportunity um there's already seems to be quite a lot of interest in this whiskey and um the last thing you want to do maybe if you've been enjoying yourself is rushing to buy, try and buy something online and compete against other people so you've got until tomorrow morning 10 o'clock and you can buy that bottle if you have that code in your inbox already check your spam uh, it should be there so uh yeah a real delight to uh be selling that whiskey and drinking it tonight and and, and having a roll my whiskey's uh name on it so actually johnny thank you again for coming to me with that um, only a fool would have said no to that whiskey originally, and uh, I'm really grateful you brought it to us. No, well, um, th th thank you for getting equally excited about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's uh, we're not just we're not just shifting product, are we? We're, we're, we're lucky when when amazing liquids like that just seem to pass through us, and um, and it, it feels like a, a gift of the gods when it, when you do get to work with them in your business. It's great. Um, so talking about lovely whiskies, next up we've got Ardmore and we're introducing um, a little bit of smoke, uh, a little bit of peat here. So we've got an Ardmore 2009 small batch, so not single car, small batch. Uh, and as I'm sure you'll tell us soon, matured in ex isla cask. So, well, I'll briefly summarise that. So Ardmore, um, not on isla, but tends to have a little bit of smoke anyway. And uh, it has been matured in a cask that previously held Isla whiskey. So there's a little bit of residual influence from the previous host of the cask, which I'm going to say is Lefroig, probably, is it? Uh, I couldn't possibly confirm that it is Lefroig. It's Lefroig, definitely. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> I, I know Johnny so well, I can tell. Uh, I've won so much money off him in poker over the years. Um, <laughs> that's not true. I'm rubbish at poker. So... I think, Johnny, you wanted to tell us a little bit more about um, Berry Brothers as uh, as an independent bottler. So yeah, I mean, the, the this Ardmore is, is is kind of a new um, a new thing for us in the sense that it's this kind of small batch idea. Um, so McIver and I, McIver's sort of head 
head box spirits buyer and I'm, I'm his assistant or uh, Doug's, Doug's body um, if he's a Doug um, uh, and you know we, we we've always really just worked quite simply in terms of we find a cask that's really good and we bottle it as a single cask simple really um, but recently we've started um, looking at this idea of small batch so we'll find um, two or three casks which are good uh, but when you bat them they're significantly better um and then we're bottling these at 46 percent, so it's kind of it's a slightly larger product so we keep the cost of goods down it's a little bit cheaper it's more accessible yada 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 but it also crucially tastes better than it was casks and um you know someone in someone in marketing had kind of you know thought oh this is a this is a new thing for Betty brothers and Brad. um and actually it's, it's it's not really you know we've been doing this for i think over a century um and I, I joined, well, I started working with Berries um, eight years ago, 2012, um, was when I first turned up at your desk, Arthur, with a home printed price list and a, a head full of ideas. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, a few more wrinkles now. Um, but I, I really quickly just fell in love with Berry Brothers and Rudd. I mean, how can you not when you, you know, do that tour of the shop, and you see these old dusty bottles and you meet people like Ronnie and Doug and... Uh, you know, even the family, the, the berries is just a kind of place that really gets its hooks into people. So I started doing a bit of more, a bit more research about um, our history, independent bottling as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure that we are the oldest independent bottler. I'm not, I'm not saying we were the first ones to do it, but I think we are the oldest still in existence. So the oldest thing of, with any evidence from Gordon McPhail is 1930. And we're talking here about, um, non-proprietary bottlings of single malt so you know you could argue like the original johnny walker was an independent bottler but let's not get too pedantic um so sink single malt bottling someone else's label um so gordon mcphail 1930 caden heads 1950 um we've got quite a lot of stuff before that which as if by magic i think you're gonna uh, flash up this so this this is just one of my favorite things in the, the berry's archive it's just so cool so yeah, my geeky off. sense is a twist, uh, 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 twitching here. I mean, look at that list. Oh. Absolutely. Well, the, if the first thing to really notice is, is the top left corner, February 07. Um, and we've got a pretty similar list to this from February 1909. So it's published again two years later with a nice price increase as well, which is lovely. Same product, slightly higher prices. Um, <laughs> You're good at that. You're good at that. <laughs> but these, these, were, these were vest pocket prices, uh, they were called. So they would actually fit in your... your, your pocket here they're, they're really wee hi so if, if if you go back to that 1907 one please um you can see some of the products on there so you've got um 1885 talisker i mean yeah oof. you know like i would pretty much i'd probably sell one of my kids for that um 100, 120 shillings for a dozen bottles absolutely 1897 mcallen available by the gallon, you know, five liters of 1897 Macallan. Oof, you know, that's some party. Um, and is, this, it, is it wrong of me to also want to, absolutely, I want to try those things, but I also really want to try the cooking rum. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I noticed that, the, the rum cooking, rum fine. Interestingly, the 1909 one, there's actually a pre-batched cocktail as well. Um, it's called like uh, some American Independence Cocktail or something. Um, right, that is it's, interesting. It's lots of pretty weird things. But I mean, th this is, you know, way ahead of its time. If you think about, you know, if you go to like a Glenfiddich marketing event, they'll tell you they invented single malt in the 70s. But this is, you know, 1907. And you've got Macallan, Talisker, Glenlivet. Okay, Glenlivet would have been a, a batting of different space sides. Um, all available, you know, by the dozen or by the gallon. And these casks would have been stored in Berry Brothers' cellar. So you would come along with your own vessel, your own gallon demijohn, or probably you would send your butler, quite frankly, um, who would come along and they would, you know, fill up a, a gallon of talisker. Um, and then I think you've got some labels as well, do we? Mm -hmm. Can I just also say the 70 year old Scotch is not that much different to the cooking rum? I'm, I, it's wrong of me to be so intrigued. 42 well, shillings uh, for the, the cooking rum and 45 shillings for the seven-year-old Scotch. 
Now, the price difference in Metal- McAllen and Talisker is interesting as well because the Talisker, okay, it's a lot older, but it's a lot more expensive. You know, it yeah. kind of suggests that's the more interesting brand at the time um, or, yeah. you know, still the rename. Um, yeah, also the Glenlivet as well, very old Glenlivet. There's trust there of what that is, 96 shillings against your 1897 McAllen Glenlivet with a name distillery, you know, the difference to, anyway, yeah. Labels, uh, you've got some cool ones. Is that the one you wanted? Yeah, well, any of them, fine, really. Um, so the, this is possibly our oldest label. You know, they don't they don't have the bottling date on this one, frustratingly. Um, but yeah, Balmanach distilled 1896 and Balmanach even now is still quite old style you know this kind of like weird hulking distillery hidden away in Speyside that no one's ever seen worm tubs and long fermentation so back then you know if Balmanach's hard to get to now how hard was Balmanach to get to in 1896 you know um and th- this is a label that we still use today so we still use this for special bottlings uh for one of our Japanese exporters we still still use this label uh some amazing whiskey stuff um, so I also think that is probably the longest running single malt label or continuously used single malt label as well. I mean, Lefroy hasn't massively changed in the last 120 years or something, but I think, you know, it's, that, that label is still used pretty much as it is with a few legal tweaks. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's, you know, to me, that's just, it's so exciting. Uh, yeah. and I think you've got, you, you've got some other you, ones. Yeah, if you fail to come up with new ideas for long enough, it becomes a merit, doesn't it? You just... <laughs> <laughs> but it's just class. You know, it's, to, it's, it's just confidence in quality. If you are yes, confident so. that you're, you're focused on quality, then just, you know, eschew all this uh, bells and whistles and shiny stuff. Yeah, so um, what's a 1900 Tanisker bottled... During the war, uh, during the First World War, to clarify. Yeah, 1916, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, th- th- this is a bottle that I, I bought from uh, an American chap who moved across um, to Dumfries. Uh, 1922, 18-year-old, uh, US export at 46%, um, and uh, opened it um, promptly. And it was amazing, really like kind of chiseled, minerally kind of like, lychee old style peat i mean just incredible whiskey um, and that is a bottle of the old vatted glen livet which was on the 1907 price oh, yeah. which was available believe it or not by the dram at dornach castle hotel um oh, yeah. no longer unfortunately but yeah phil and simon managed to pick up a, a case of old berry brothers bottlings um amazing i just i'm just going to go back because i can't put Balmanic on the screen without saying hello to Sandy, our warehouse manager, whose father and more of his relatives, I forget how many, but work at Balmanic. So, Is that right? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he's, he, he grew up um, right next door to the distillery, basically, Karen. Yeah. So, um, great. Uh, well, the Ardmore, we should, we should talk mm. about it, shouldn't we? I find Ardmore has this kind of slight coal dusty kind of character like it's it's smoky but it's like coal dust or like a coal i've got a fire or something like coal scuttle kind of it feels different the kind of smokiness that it has to me but that's the, the thing that always comes out for ardmore for me uh two, two things one one is cullen skink which the copywriters at berries consistently take out of my tasting notes um yeah and the other one is um like hessian you know sort of um, yeah, well, they, they took out sewer plumes and they took out um, uh, Cullen Skink and I've just put in Freezer Borough Buttery on Francis' suggestion oh. for a new daft mill. He said, I don't want Freezer Borough Butteries. So, uh, oh. Or a rally, depending on where you're from. But <laughs> I, the, 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 the sewer plumes I get, but I don't think any food or drink product gets sold well if it's described as fish, fishy soup, unless... <laughs> It's fishy soup. But do you know what I mean? There, there is something <laughs> smoked haddock about this, I think. Yeah, you know, okay, it's kind of smoked haddock, smoked barley, and yeah, hessian is the other, that kind of like, you know, potato sack material, kind of musty and earthy. And... Bun cloth, another great yeah. marketing tasting note. Um, Ronnie, <laughs> you enjoy, are you enjoying the introduction of a little bit of smoke to your evening? 
Yeah, well, actually, I, no, well, you know, I, I was never very keen on smoke all my life, but actually I've been introduced to it in a gentle sort of way, and actually I really love it now. So, I, but provided it's not overpowering, what mm. I, I always find slightly disappointing is if the smoke is just totally dominant and, and you can't really, you can't smell anything through the smoke. But over the years, I've learned to sort of habituate my mind to the smoke and then look underneath and delve underneath. It's not all that easy, and I know a lot of people find it a real struggle. But this is this is lovely to me. This this PT this is more of a sort of uh, a far side PT. I know what you mean by the coal scuttle, but uh, I still get this um, from from Ardmore. I get the sort of more aromatic floral PTness uh, that I grew up with as a kid. You know, on the fire in in Mauritius. Lovely. It's very very happy memory. Uh, a question for Colin Hamden White. Hello, Colin. Um, was it already peated before the cast maturation? So they do make a few different types of spirit at Ardmore. Um, and I guess he's asking, was it peated spirit that went into the ex Isla cask? Yeah, the, the guys at the distillery actually, I, th I think you can buy Ardmore unpeated as Ard layered, um, but they, they call it Ard less, which I, I quite enjoyed actually. Uh, Ardmore, <laughs> Ard less. Um, but no, th th this, this, is, this is classic Ardmore. So I, I don't know what the. PPM is I kind of um, don't have to worry too much about that, but yes, it's a very lightly peated malt. But then it's it's not an ex isla re rack; it's an ex isla full maturation. Um, so you know, if you leave something in ex Lafroy barrels for ten years, it's it's going to come on quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's really good. It's really good. I really like Ardmore. I think it's a really nice whiskey. It's, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. To it's it's one of those distilleries where you can you can really identify it. You know, it's it's mm. it's it's truly idiosyncratic and has its own character. Um, yeah, and it's 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 just not it's one you know you put in a glass it, you might get it mixed up with like Talisker Long Row, but really you're probably going to pick out his art more. But that's what great company Talisker and Long Row. Poof. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I think that speaks of its quality, but because. People don't chase it with with a, a passion of those other two distilleries that you just mentioned. For example, that um, it can kind of sit there on the shelf for a while, and people can find themselves uh, a, a delightful whiskey with all that, without all the hassle and, uh, <laughs> and without all this nagging doubt that if they hadn't opened it, it might be worth <laughs> more money yeah. in six months' time. No, um, I, I love Ardmore. I mean, I, 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 again, I, any make that has real character, you know, I tend to tend to fall for and is definitely one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question time. So for people, if you're starting to think about uh, anything you want to ask any of us, but especially Johnny and Ronnie, the two Ollies, um, the, uh, then feel free to fire them through because we're, we're, we're on to a bit of a free swim at the end now. We've been go, going over an hour. It's really flown by. But mm -hmm. as we enjoy the, the Williamson, which I'll just pop that up on screen, um, uh, and briefly, I suppose we should, in, in case people don't know, um, so this is Williamson uh, 2012 vintage, another single cask, um, fairly pokey strength, we'll take a bit of water, I'm sure. Um, Johnny, do you want to take that about distillery provenance, or would you like me just to say it? Well, uh, yeah, in essence, you know, as an independent bottler, you know, you get offered named distillery makes, and that's great. But often you'll also get uh, what's called a kind of private maker, uh, anonymous, where you can't legally name the distillery. Um, and, you know, my view as an independent bottler is um, that, that's totally fine. We need to stand by the quality of what's in the bottle. So I'm more than happy to bottle something if we can't see what's on the bottle um, because, you know, we need to live and die by the quality and the brand name. This is one of those cases. However, Williamson's hardly a secret. You know, it's, it's named after the 1960s. Um, Facility manager Bessie Williamson uh, of of Lafroig. So this is basically a well, it is a single cast Lafroig. Uh, we just can't legally say that. Um, yeah. So the idea, if people, um, you know, where, where this came from, this idea of teaspooning or calling a single malt spirit something else comes because the wheels of the industry turn because blenders are able to buy and swap single malt from their competitors. They need it as their ingredients to go into blends. But as 
single malt brand started to rise in popularity and therefore value, then suddenly the idea of letting this thing that you work so hard to market and sell go into the arms of someone else who can put the name of the distillery on their bottle as an independent bottling started to become a problem. So the big distillers principally started to bypass that by agreeing to sell their competitors this liquid but under a different name, so they can never legally put that on the bottle. Is that a fair summary? Uh, it's a very fair summary, yeah. Good. Okay, we covered that slightly clunky thing, but effectively, we are drinking spirit from a distillery called Lefroy. And it's a, a, play, a fairly visceral drink, isn't it? It's a... <laughs> Yeah, I was actually, um, a friend of mine uh, in London had, had coronavirus, and um, their test for whether their sense of smell existed or not was whether they could smell uh, Williamson. Um, and it was it was a sample they had. Um, and for five days, they could put their nose into this glass and not smell it, which I struggle wow. to believe because you don't you don't smell it. You feel it. You know, I mean, it is like a kind of. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty existential experience. Um <laughs> But yeah, after after day five, you could smell it again. So we're, we're okay. The um, and I often they say, "Oh, mezcal is a bit like uh, smoky whiskey, smoky single malt whiskey." But I get an element of this very slightly vegetal agave mezcal, smoky, uh, smoky agave element to it as well, as well as heavily peated private whiskey. But. Um, Ronnie, regale us. Tell us something. What what does this dram say to you? I know every dram uh, sparks a memory in you. It does, kind of. Um, I'm not going to tell you the story is too long, but uh, when I went to Isla for the very first time, but this this evokes um, a tea called Lapsang Suchong that I'm not sure people know nowadays, but certainly it was very popular in the Victorian days. Not that I was alive in those days, but um, <laughs> my grandmother used to absolutely adore Lapsang Suchong tea. And that, as a top note, came through almost immediately. And I, I, I think that there are times of, um, of enjoying um, smoky whiskies, which are very different to those of uh, non-smoking. And uh, it, it is to do with mood, no doubt. And they are great mood enhancers. Um, and they're great rewards, I think, for outdoor activities too. So after a cold day in the outdoors, um, it's a kind of just the most fabulous reward to have some smoke in it. And if you haven't been to Isla, um, I think it just exaggerates the experience of drinking Isla so many times and makes it so much more fun. Um, if you have visited uh, these wonderful distilleries over there, um, it's just, it kind of transports you from wherever you are in the world back to that particular distillery. Mm. Uh, and I find some sherry do that, and certainly Isla would do that to me. I, have to say, I, I, I totally agree with Ronnie's point. I mean, as you, as you know, if I'm not, uh, working or um, being embattled with the twins, I'll tend to be on a mountain, and there is nothing better than cold mountain air and peaty whiskey, and the two yeah. just absolutely integrate on your palate. You know, take a good slug of Lefroy, and then breathe in cold, freezing cold mountain air, and the two just go together. It's like it's it's like a food pairing. You know, it's yeah. like whiskey and chocolate. Exactly. Or whatever. Okay. The two just work amazingly well so much better. and have you heard that thing that charlie mclean said about I, I can't remember where it came from but he, he spoke of some um scottish gentry elderly man but had you know lived in a big house for a long time and he said how uh, they used to keep the isla whiskey um in the effectively what the the boot room i, I don't go shooting Ronnie. i'm sure you've 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 you're a pretty decent shot um but they would keep the Isla whiskey down there because you would never have it in the house. You would never even think of drinking it in right. the house. Yeah, that it was an outdoor whiskey. And, oh, really? and I yeah, never yeah, I've never heard that either. But straight away, I was like, I know. I always, I wouldn't consider drinking anything other than Isla whiskey if you're on a walk or, as you say, up a mountain. I occasionally get up, get up them. Um, but um, 
Yeah, but it, it is very much like that. There's a few people talking about this teaspoony thing and asking about this. Um, Tom's asking for hints on the mystery dram. No. Um, uh, but he's, he's then saying single cask blended malt effectively. And I'll just rattle through a few. Is it single malt? Seen Williamson as a blended malt recently a lot. Um, and uh, someone else saying, what's Williamson tea, teaspooned with? So I'll just quickly tell you that, Johnny. I think it's been a change. Uh, and someone also mentioned that you see it from 2010. So it seemed to be a strategy that big distillers were taking. And there was a lot of chatter about teaspoons and the idea that they would turn it into a blended malt that would taste the same just by adding a little bit of something else and a blender could still use it. But I get the feeling they're starting to give up with that a little bit. And as long as you put a different thing on the on the transfer note, as they were called, delivery note, as they would call it, for the transfer of ownership, then actually it doesn't really matter. You can never call it the frog. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that teaspooning has ever actually happened. I mean, the concept yeah. that someone would either go in and putting a tiny amount into each cask or disgorge them all, vat in another cask and put them back into cask seems kind of fanciful to me um mm -hmm. so yeah I think, I think it's all about what's in the document it, it, i think anyway yeah um i'm just going to put this out in case i forget where do people try for the mystery cask i think you mean where do you enter if you bought a pack you should have an email but effectively you email contact at rulemarwhiskies.com with your answers by did I say Tuesday at two o'clock? I think I did. Tuesday at two o'clock. That's how you do that then, Colin. Um, and if you're watching, then you could probably still buy a pack. I've got a few packs left over. Give it a taste and and, and then still enter. But um, uh, yeah, I think we're, we're kind of getting there, guys, aren't we? There's, um, there's, I don't see any specific questions. Johnny, Ronnie, anything else? Anything further we wanted to say? Well... Not really, except that it's a, it's a great pleasure to be able to see people, um, even though it's rem you know it's not virtual and remote. Um, this sort of thing never existed, you know, forty years ago. So no, people have got no idea how lucky we are. Just um, you know, to go through a plague as we've gone through uh, or going through, and still to be able to communicate with other people. I mean, this is this is pretty extraordinary. A telephone, you know, is only a hundred years old or slightly more, but. Um, you know how fast technology has moved things forward, um, and and I think to a large degree how it's how it's really catapulted single malts into the sort of stratosphere that it's in at the moment, uh, together with prices, of course, which is not so uh, exciting for those people, those of us who like buying whiskies, but it, it's great for people who like selling and collecting whiskies, I suppose. Yeah, I mean it, it's true, Ronnie. You say this technology. I mean, I remember the first. The first time we tried to do this and there's maybe a couple of people had done it already and it was the guys at adelphi that suggested it and it was like it was forced on us in march and it was like would it work but it's there's something still there's something really lovely about us sharing a dram and other people at home sharing a dram and everyone drinking the same thing and okay it's not like being in a pub and we all look forward to being in a pub or some whiskey festival or something but it's pretty good I like it's the it. next best thing it's the next yeah. best thing well, I have to say, Arthur, I think, I think you do a really genuinely good job of hosting these things. And, you know, I've listened to a few, um, yeah. I have to say, without buying the pack because I'm a cheapskate. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I, I, put, I put it on while I'm working uh, and I listen to it in the background. And it is, it's like a kind of like highbrow whiskey show on Radio 4. Um, mm. So, you know, consider yourself doing like a sort of public service broadcast. I, I, I think you do a great job hosting them. So thank you very much for Sounds doing great. it over the last few months. I mean, Radio 4, that is a dream. I would have accepted Radio 2. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not at all, not at all. Sorry, that's, I'm, in, I'm in 5 Live. <laughs> uh, oh, hang on. There is actually a question coming in. Sorry. Um, here we go. Tom, to Johnny and Ronnie, lots of new distilleries, and no Darth Mal is one you're bottling, but what other ones are you really interested in trying? Which horses are you backing in the future for to be great, great the new great distilleries? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I think any whiskey nerd is going to be Dornick, Really, you know, Phil and Simon are doing some really interesting stuff, um, putting the the sort of theories of us 
nerds to test. So, you know, if it comes out and their whiskey's horrible, then you know, I'm sharp about yeast, I guess. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we're, we're bottling some really interesting stuff um, from some international distilleries next year, uh, focusing on the Nordics. Um, and I've been super impressed with the quality of some of these distilleries that, I don't, you know, I'd always just look to international whiskey as something kind of like inferior and a waste of my time. Uh, but, you know, some some of the new things at the Nordics are amazing. So, um, well, it was yeah. such a heartland of whiskey appreciation. It, it really was. And I don't do so much traveling, but I went over to Sweden a bit, um, uh, Germany a bit, a few places. And, um, and you know, it was so clear. It was eye-opening when I was buying stuff for the Scotch Rock Whiskey Society and then for all my whiskies and going over to these things. How much more they knew about whiskey. So... Well, that's a nice thing. People starting these distilleries are also nerds. You know, that's what I mean? I'm saying. They're yeah, out out of these incredible whiskey clubs. Yeah. They got a bit of money together. They were successful in some other area, and they also wanted to prove a point. A bit like Phil and. Simon. But you know, they, 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 yeah, when you talk to these guys, they're referencing like 1960s Springbank, and there's not a lot of Scottish distillers who actually go out and buy 1960s um, Springbank. So. I can see a few questions. I'm not going to name the distilleries, but yeah, we've got uh, one from Norway. We've got a couple from Sweden, a t couple from Denmark, uh, one from Finland. So you know, all, all the Nordic countries except Iceland. Um, but well, uh, yeah, so it's, 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 it's uh, uh, no, we're not 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 doing Iceland. No, uh, but no, yeah, what no, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and uh, sorry, Norway. I thought it was in a whiskey pub quiz, and you said I was a flocky, flocky. I, I named it quickly. <laughs> a few people more forthcoming with their guesses on this one. Um, uh, so uh, they are prepared to guess on that one. Um, but and uh, what about Ronnie? Are you interested in the new guys? Are you are you talking you know, around him? I think there's a lot of really wonderful stuff going on. Um, they've got great whiskies to compare to. Um, they've got the benefits of uh, understanding the wood policies of others, um, and uh, you know, like Mr. Masataka Takatsuro. Uh, of all those years ago, a hundred years ago, um, there isn't really any great excuse for producing a poor or indifferent whiskey any longer. I think what will be really interesting, not in my lifetime, but in yours, is what the Chinese do with um, distilling Scotch whiskey, distilling whiskey in the same sort of line as Scotch whiskey. Because already there's an interest there, over there, in, in building distillery already you know, Forsyth is taking orders from China. And in how long will it take? I don't know, but um, it won't be too long before we see Chinese whiskey on the market to a company, you know, whiskeys from all over the world. And I think it's, it's no bad thing, um, but we've got to make sure that we're on our toes. Uh, mm. an and that, you know, I, I was just hoping that people really pay attention to quality and that that is uh, more important, in my view, certainly in the single more business and the development of single more business than, than, than anything else. Um, apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think that would be Ronnie's ringtone. <laughs> yeah, my, no. my dog saying it's dinner time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I your, do that, your dog has a phone? Um, <laughs> dog has a phone and a bone, yeah. <laughs> Dog has a thing. Um, and I think there, and I think, uh, you know, uh, United States of America could come good. And I think, um, I mean, I don't know too much about the new distilleries, uh, unlike you, Johnny, but I know that, you know, the Ballandarach is coming up. There are, there are a lot of interesting ones. One of the big problems, of course, in the olden days was finding a route to market. So finding a distributor mm -hmm. or an in individual countries around the world because there weren't all that many importers. And today, if you have a look at the Chinese method of distribution, it is it is very much online. So they've skipped through this wholesale, mm. retail tier. These levels, yeah. And, and, and they just go direct to the consumer. And as a result, the prices come down, of course. Um, but um, they don't have the old shoe leather like they used to have in building brands. So uh, there's a sort of balance somewhere between the two. But I think um, I think that will happen probably a little bit more um, so that uh, retailers um, 
that have online will benefit, as we've seen over the last sort of 10 years anyway, um, being able to ship overseas and so on. But I would also say that, you know, history is a really important part of it. And uh, when your, your program, your lovely broadcast, Liquid Antiquarian, um, that you have with Dave Broom. Um, well, thanks for, thanks for what you've watched, have you, Ronnie? I have. In fact, you, I, sent, you sent me a lovely email. You did send me lovely emails. I thought, it, I thought it was magical. And I missed, sadly, the others. So I hope you've recorded them and I can see them. Um, because, um, you know, there's a lot of memorabilia um, around that people don't appreciate. And I know, Arthur, you were one of the very first people that actually says, you know, it's not all about flavor. There's a huge amount of history behind these, um, these not only the brands, but the industry as per se. Um, you know, it didn't just start. Uh, you know, those pioneers of yesteryear in the 19th century um, were serious pioneers. How can you go to a place like Caracas, Venezuela, and tell them that your fire water from Scotland is better than their fire water made out of sugar cane, you know, and people believe you. I mean, it, 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 that was that was real pioneer stuff. When I started in the whiskey business, you know, less than 1% of the category was single malts. Today, it's now 10%. And that's thanks to people like you and, and, and the bloggers, the journalists, and the, you know, hundreds of people, the people who are ambassadors. I mean, why isn't cognac in the same sort of position? Um, you know, tequila doesn't have the same sort of reverence, although it's gaining reverence. Uh, and, and, you know, that's why I said that earlier on the Scottish Whiskey Association is a, is a good thing, because you, you've got to have rules and regulations of some sort, otherwise the whole thing gets broken down. And, you know, the demise of the vodka category, if you can call it a demise, it's not perhaps a demise yet, but was the, was the existence or the arrival of flavoured vodkas, because people then don't appreciate the true vodka per se. The same thing will happen to the gin market, I think. And then you'll, you'll find that it goes back to the solid, you know, six or seven brands. They may be new brands compared to the old ones. Um, but in single malts, you know, we've got protection. We've got people who are making sure that the values of single malt are appreciated around the world. And, uh, you know, thus it's got a proper construction and underpinning it all, you know, for the likes of all of us. And I think it's got a great future still. Yeah, I think you're right. There's so much history still to explore. There's so much new stuff coming uh, as well. I think, you know, so there's, sometimes it seems all a bit doom and gloom online, but I'm tremendously excited that I've hopefully, unless I get the sack, got another couple of decades at least working in the whiskey industry um, to see what happens. It's going to be really, really interesting. But I notice it's a few minutes to nine which is when uh, we have to start selling this Ben Nevis. I can't even remember if it's my job to switch it on and monitor it, but I'll, I'll have a go. Um, guys, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, thank you so much um, for oh, joining us. You. Yeah, and actually, I will say, for arranging to get these miniatures bottled, it's not easy, it's a nuisance, but people really appreciate the, the, the chance to try these small samples and join up online and... Um, and and hear from um, great and knowledgeable people such as yourself. So well, um, I see. Well, th thank you much for having us, and it's it's amazing as well. You know, the, the great thing about these wee bottles is that even more people can try it, and I think they're great whiskies. So hmm. yeah, thank you both. And it's a, yeah for myself, it's a real pleasure to be able to share a very small screen with um, two two whiskey heroes. Oh. <laughs> one, one. The guy sorry, I, meant, I, meant, I meant Ronnie and his dog. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no, Johnny. And uh, final word from you, Ronnie. No, just thank you very much indeed for doing this because I think it's such a wonderful way of communication on during these terrible times. And uh, be safe, everybody. Wear a mask and look after yourselves and uh, keep spreading the word. As Biden says, you know, my grandmother said, keep spreading the faith. And grandpa <laughs> says, um, keep believing or keep the faith. Um, so, you know, in, in Scotch whiskey, I think the, the single malt side is probably the most exciting and a uh, long way to go. And thank you, Arthur. And thank you, Johnny, for allowing me to come on to your show. Right. You better, you better go and feed that dog, your technologically aware dog. <laughs> Good night, Ronnie. Cheerio. Um, great. So we'll wrap this up very quickly. There's a few, few. Um, oh, there's a few questions coming in. We'll maybe, um, 
we'll maybe answer those directly through, through comments. Uh, but everyone seems uh, really appreciative of the evening and the whiskies. Uh, very briefly, uh, just to say um, that the next tasting uh, is, and in fact, I think our last of the year is with old Pulteney. We've just put the packs live, including an exclusive single cask, um, single sherry cask. And we're going to be hearing from the distillery manager, Malcolm Waring, if his connection uh, survives way up there in the north of Scotland, and also Lucas as backup as well. Um, so please join us for that. Thank you very much. I've really enjoyed it, and uh, see you next time. Cheerio.